Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Aoki. And I'm DJ Trouble from Sonic FM. I read that uh, you're on this huge tour, right? Promoting Wonderland. Is it true that you had to mortgage your house to go on this tour, or was that just something that you just kind of said? Um, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, let's just say this tour was the most expensive project that I've ever invested in. I spent like a year working on all the um, the visuals and the and the lights and everything with the the team that I work with. The team that I work with is amazing. They actually do stuff for Dead Mouse and Daft Punk. So awesome. Yeah, like, uh, so I've been working with them. We did the Identity Festival last year, which was a U.S. tour, a bus tour that I did, and then um, and then on this one we just readapted, evolved the uh, the show, the visuals and everything like that. So. Um, so you're on tour like what is it like 280 days out of this year or something like that? Well, yeah, I think 2012 will be really busy again, um, even more than, than, let's say, last year. I think last year was like 250. So, um, I mean, but this is like a lifestyle I've accepted a long time ago. So even back in 07, I was touring a lot. How do you, okay, has anybody been to a Steve Aoki show before? Yeah. Right. Do you know how hard this guy goes, right? How do you do that night in, night out, get up? run your record label, produce music, handle business, and then go do a show that same night? Like, are you drinking, like, some sort of special tea? Do you just have rock star blood? <laughs> do you have the tiger blood? Like, how do you do it? Um, I'm just focused, you know? I, like, stay focused with my work. Because at the end of the day, all of this is, like, you have to believe in what you're doing. And if you believe in it, then you're going to commit to it, you know? So um, with my label, I've been running it for, like, 15, 16 years now. Um, I love just the, the um, watching artists grow and develop into, you know, bigger artists like Bloody Beat Roots or like Block Party back, you know, like close to 10 years ago. Wasn't that the first uh, band that you had signed to your label? Uh, that was like actually when we released Block Party on Dimock, uh, that was the 69th release. So we were already, you know, years in. But we were putting out like rock kind of stuff back then. So um, like we put out like Battles First EP. We put out The Kills First record. We put out like, you know, rock and rock and roll kind of bands. And then in 07, that's when we started signing dance records. And we signed Mastercraft and, and Bloody Beat Roots um, in 07. And then since then, we've been putting out a few um, artists outside of the dance world. Like put out this experimental R&B artist um, Rob Roy and this British band called New Ivory. But for the most part, like this this year, we um, we have Infected Mushrooms album coming out. We have Felix Cartel's second album coming out. He's a Vancouver guy. Right. Um, Auto Erotics, like you know, a bunch bunch of singles by them. They're also Canadian. Datsik, we just signed him. He's another Canadian. He's on the show tonight. And he's on the show tonight. And we have his album coming out. Got a lot of Canadian love, you know, I, I love it up here. Uh, all the shows I do are, are always awesome. I've toured everywhere through Canada. I've played in Lloydminster. Right. I, 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 I used to live in Saskatoon, so I know, okay, I I know exactly where I'm in Regina. I played in Regina. Yeah. I played in Newfoundland. I mean, like, Victoria Island, you know, like, every nook and cranny, like, Kamloops. I, I mean, even in, in Ontario, I played in like Richmond Hill, no. you know, Guelph, like, or even um, North, North Bay, North Bay. It's like way up there in Ontario, you know? So like, I will come and do work out here and play all these different places because I love Canada and I, and uh, I love coming out here. What's your favorite spot in Canada to play? Um... It, well, I, it's my biggest shows have been in Edmonton. Right. I used to live in Edmonton. I just moved to yeah. Edmonton. It's crazy. It's like, <laughs> no, you I think know, like Toronto, I know Montreal, like, yeah. Vancouver. Like, <laughs> Vancouver is one of my favorite cities in the world. I love this place. I've been coming here for a lot. Um, this is kind of like the gateway for me for Canada because right. it's, on my, it's on my coast. So um, I was playing 
See, back in like 05, 06, 07, I was playing hipster parties, which are very different from proper like EDM parties. Right. And I was playing those hipster parties in Vancouver. So I was playing with like Paul Devereaux, who's like part of Mad Decent. And, and um, you know, I, I have a long history here, but like it's a different, whole different scene in different time. Now, speaking of hipsters, uh, you recently said that hipsters aren't really showing you as much love anymore. As they, they don't show love them. anyways, though. <laughs> that's like, they just like, that's, it's against the code. You know, you're breaking the rules if you show love. You have to, you have to like kind of hate everything and, you know, and, um, you know, you just you have, you, have, you have to have an attitude and have like a little ego. Right, and, and on that topic, how has sort of your crowd changed uh, from the earlier shows years ago to now, these bigger shows and stuff like that? Uh, is electronic music, do you think, uh, is it progressing or...? Yeah, I mean, that's for sure. I mean, music's always evolving anyways. But for me personally, I, I came from a DJ background, like where I was just playing parties. And people came to my shows um, because they wanted to be part of that kind of environment right so they weren't coming from my music because i wasn't really putting out that many records i was doing remixes back then so um it was just a different kind of party and then when i started producing songs that that um kids were excited about that's when things started changing for me as from becoming from a dj to an artist and having artists more artist driven shows like you know playing at peony versus playing at like uh I don't even know, like some small, like divey club right. in Vancouver. And, and there's nothing wrong with that either, you know, because I, I, had, I had a lot of fun back then too. It was just a different, different time and place. And uh, now kids are coming for the music. And, and I, even myself as a DJ, I've evolved where, like for this tour in 2012, now I'm playing all my own music. I'm not really toying with other right. records. And I want to give people the you know as much of an aoki experience I, as i can give because if they're going to come see my show i want to just give them my music you know and before i would play like majority of my music and then i would you know put in dimok tracks because of course i want to be supporting all the artists on dimok but um on this particular show because it's it is um it is a big production um and i've spent so much time with each song each song is part of like like a movement you know um and and they're all kind of intrins intrinsically aligned with each other so it's just like a, a story the, uh, that's the way i developed the show so um yeah that's, i'm excited to play for vancouver all right so um there's a lot of people might know especially the ones who've been to the shows before you like to get a little crazy at these shows, right? You take your shirt off, you're pouring booze all over orange people, juice, trying to get juice. it in their mouth. But uh, all about the juice now. So <laughs> kids, you know, I can't. Oh be, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess it's all ages tonight. So yeah, what? Yeah. Do, or do you have cranberry alcohol? juice? <laughs> cranberry juice. Close your eyes. It burns. <laughs> Trust me. I get it in my eyes. It burns my eyes. I can't even see straight. So close those eyes, and I'll pour it in your mouth. <laughs> Actually, I like doing that because it's colorful. Right. Like with like champagne or something, it's kind of more of a spray. But with cranberry juice and oranges, it's just like orange colors like all over your face. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's part of the whole kind of EDM colorful world, you know. So if I had some blue juice, like maybe grape juice, orange juice, cranberry, you have blue, orange, red. I need like green juice too, and then I'm good. It's almost like you're making Just, a painting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it tastes good. You know, it's good for you. It's healthy. It's got nutritional properties in it. You know? So you're, you're actually helping people out. Not only do you entertain, but yeah, you're well, also hydrating helping them. them. You're hydrating them. Right. These kids in the front, like, they're like die hard. They won't leave. They're like, like dying. They're getting crushed by the, on the barricades. They have bruises all over themselves. I need to at least hydrate them. Some of them get pulled out. You know, I feel bad. Okay. So um, you also like to stage dive, right? Uh, now when stage diving, maybe some tips for anybody who's sitting here in case they feel like stage diving one day, what's a good thing to keep in mind as you leap off that stage? 
Um, well, you got to make sure they're going to catch you. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good, like, good start. That's like the first thing you should think about. Because a lot of people just jump and people have no idea that someone's going to jump on them. And then they like their first instinct is to move. Like, oh, shit, someone's like fucking jumping on me. You know, um, so I've seen that more oftentimes than than successful dives. Do you have um, any uh, stage diving fail stories? Oh, yeah, yeah. But... Uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've, um, I've, I feel like I've somewhat mastered it to a certain extent. Um, you know, it's a numbers game. Eventually, I'm gonna get hurt. But um, <laughs> in the beginning, well, in the beginning, the beginning, the beginning of my stage diving career, which was like when I was 13. Um, yeah, like there's 13. Yeah, because I was in punk and hardcore bands and oh, okay, going to punk and hardcore shows, and that's that's just status quo. Like, you're there and, like, everyone's stage diving all over the place. So it's like you look forward to go and stage dive while the band's playing and somehow sneak up on the stage and jump off before they kick you off the stage. That's like, that was like, every, you know, every time I went to a show, I had to do that at least one time. So, um, yeah, like, I hurt my elbow pretty bad. But that's like the drunk stage dive. That's like, you shouldn't do the drunk stage dive. That's a really dangerous one to do. Yeah, I did I that. I thought that those were the only kind of stage that. Oh man, those are those those are the those are the worst that you could do, because you feel like you're invincible first of all, and then you just jump and dive, and and when you realize you're on the ground, you're already, you know. Just, I don't know. It's just. I've seen you on top of crowds in like little rubber dinghies and stuff. That's safety. Oh. <laughs> safety, because if I'm gonna do a balcony dive, and um, before I brought the life raft out, you know, like I hurt myself. I mean, you jump on the crowd, you're going to like, you know, get hurt. Some, you know, sometimes it just happens. So you bring the life raft out, you have some cushion and you don't hurt anyone else either. So it's like a win-win, you know, I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want anyone at my shows to get hurt or die or, you know, whatever. I want everyone to have a good time and leave, you know, not injured so you should wear a little captain's hat next time it's like a little ssa <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad idea it's not a bad, yeah okay so a lot of people might not know but you spin all kinds of music right uh, you're a dj um so when you're not spinning that hard electro stuff uh what would be like let's say somebody just put you on some turntables as a crowd and just said play whatever you want you don't have to play your records right. you can play whatever you want what would you go to well, i look at the crowd first and kind of decide because that's like a, as a dj it's uh you know you are being selfless you have to entertain everyone you know it's different and uh when i'm producing a song it's more about myself and what i want to do and when i'm djing it's about everybody else you want to make sure everyone's having a good time so if i see you know a bunch of friends like him <laughs> i'll try to play you know you know I'm not trying to stereotype anyone, but like, what would you wanna... play for him? <laughs> 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 I don't know. It's hard to tell. Like you, you, you're like I don't know if you're like reggae or yeah, yeah. yeah. but but you have like this this kind of punk energy too. Okay. So like maybe bad brains. <laughs> I'll roll with that. <laughs> you know, um, I love all I love all music. I mean, I like. I even like pop music, and I like punk and hardcore. I like rap. I obviously love EDM. So my range of music is so wide that I really would love to play everything. And if it was, if I was in my like house, and I have complete control, then I would just play like, you know, Gorilla, Bis Gorilla Biscuits to Bad Brains to um, Skrillex to Diplo, to, you know, right. everything. I just, you know, it's, it would be less of a DJ set, more of like a playlist. Okay, so what was cooler, uh, having your own sneaker, which happened a long time ago, or being an unlockable player in NBA 2K? Um, <laughs> definitely working with Supra, because I started with Supra from day one. And um, I've known Angel, the guy that started Supra, uh, since I was like 14. So I've always looked up to him. He had TSA back in the day, then he started Crew, and then started working with Crew. And then I was really the first non-skater on the, 
on the team. So um, to have my own shoe with Supra growing from day one and seeing how successful they became in the sneaker community uh, was was amazing to, to see that. You know, it's great to be part of something in the beginning and then watch them do something authentic and successful and still stay true to the brand and where everyone still supports, wants to support them. And you get all kinds of different people in the, in the world that want to support them, like from like little Wayne to, to like, you know, sneaker heads to, you know, like all kinds of music people to whoever else. So, um, yeah, that was, that's, that's to me more cooler, but, but at the same time, you know, being an unlockable player in the game was, that was just weird. It was pretty random. It was pretty random. Yeah, yeah, that was. And then they asked me again for the next year. Right. Which I was like, I don't even know how to, sh like, I mean, I was the worst basketball player in high school. I've shot on the wrong hoop. I, I, like, made my first goal, or not the goal, but the first basket. I shot, like, against my team. And, like, my team players were like, get off the, f go. And I was like, I made it though. Like, you know, I mean, but I love Lynn because he's Asian and he's, everyone loves him. I love the fact that he's Asian and then all, like, you know, everyone's like rooting for Lynn. So that's cool. The Lynn sanity. Okay, a couple more questions for you. Yeah. Um, you've collaborated with so many big names. Uh, Will I Am, Super Black, uh, Kid Cudi. I can name them all, but we'll be here forever. Which one was sort of your favorite collaboration and uh, possibly which one uh, do you have coming down the pipe that we can look forward to? Uh, favorite is tough. Favorite's tough because that Wonderland, my album, was all, I mean, I pretty much did the whole thing myself. I didn't really um, go to management to be like, okay, I want to work with this person and can you hook me up? Like all these people, I either knew them personally or they were a friend of a friend. Um, so it was, it was, you know, it was a very personal album and, um, and I have different relationships with everybody and they're all really strong, good relationships now. Uh, I love working with Will. He's just like, you know, working with him in the studio, it's, um, he's like, he's just intuitive. He gets it right on the spot. And you actually worked with him. It wasn't like you sent him the track and he just like yeah like we we would or... get we would go to his studio record plant or he'd come you know right. work with me um but you know a lot of the time you are sending tracks back and forth you'll get ideas going but people need to work in their own space too but you know i have like cuddy in my studio i've had little john i've had chitty bang um i've had uh, uh miss palmer for no beef um like a bunch of the different guys that, like foo's come in my studio I, I went to his studio to work on red my love. from lmfao yeah um his studio is not that far from my house i live luckily la is uh is kind of a destination place for a lot of artists so if they're not living there they always end up coming there and then we you know it's easy to work together and then for future collabs i love working with travis barker he's just one of my he's one of my favorite musicians you know in general and and he's also extremely fast at working uh, together, he has a great studio, like actually 15 minutes from my house. So, I would go to his studio, and he's got like you know drum kits everywhere. You know, he's just he's so sick with drums. Um, I love working with musicians because of him. Because I, after I started working with him, I wanted to work with other people. Like, I got the guitarist from the Exploited on that. Kid, the kids will have their say track, uh, which was a lot of fun. And um, we have future collabs. We have the uh, my collab with Tiesto, Tornado. The vocal version is coming out in June. We shot a music video for that, and then I'm finishing up my collab with Knife Party, which will be coming out sometime this year. Like it's pretty much done. I just need to add a few more bells and whistles, and then um, I, I did a track with this Australian rapper named Iggy Azalea, who's like just amazing. You should, actually, you should uh, check out our YouTube of uh her song pussy <laughs> okay it's it's awesome so i i did a song with her make sure you put the artist's name in there because otherwise something else completely is going to come up and it's, well don't put pussy it, right? in google <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're going to come across something totally Either. different yeah. <laughs> um there's a, actually a bunch like did a, a collab with chris lake and one with diplo that's coming out um I mean, I don't want to say too much because, like, there's some of them won't come out for a while. Right. So, but the knife party one is gonna—I'm gonna try to release that soon. 
Okay, final question. Um, everybody here is going to the show tonight. Uh, you talk about the Steve Aoki experience. Maybe you could just break that down real quick uh, for these guys and for anybody else uh, next time you come to town who's watching this. Um, well, I don't like to give it away, okay. the live show. I've, I want to make it special. Like, I, that's why I, almost li I don't like when people film because I want to make the show like, almost exclusive to the people there because uh, I do put a lot into the show. And I treat each song like its own part of one big movement, or I was like saying, like one big play. So each song is important to me. It has different meanings, and and like for the most part, it's all about having fun. You know, I want everyone to leave the show with the best experience that they, I could possibly give them, and and uh, you know, have a good time. Great, thank you, Steve Aoki, everybody. I'm in the house.